Looking back to last month's reconstructions, there's been a most encouraging response to our appeal on the murder of Paul Stevens in Southall. 80 viewers called, many giving useful information about Paul, where he went and the people he knew. One caller in particular has taken the investigation very much further forward, so we'll let you know. On the recent series of attempted child abductions, 168 calls came in from all over the country with information on cars, similar incidents and suggested names for the woman involved. In addition to that, some 2,000 people, mostly parents and school teachers, rang the Kidscape organisation for advice on teaching children how to keep themselves safe. On photo call, call last month, we showed the picture of a woman wanted in connection with a theft and deception against an 82-year-old man who was disabled. Calls from two viewers led police to a hotel in Harrogate in Yorkshire where a woman was arrested early in the morning, in fact just a few hours after the programme. She's now been charged with theft and deception. And there's been another arrest since last month, though this time not as a result of Crime Watch, but a woman has been charged with seven cases of robberies at building societies in London. Another photo call item, but from our September programme, we showed a security video of a smartly dressed man with a briefcase as he robbed a building society. Following information from a caller living in the Orkney Islands, a man was arrested in Manchester a week later. A man has now been committed for trial, charged with robbery. Well, now to this month's photo call, a national portrait gallery of people that detectives here would dearly like to speak to. If any of the faces fit, do call. To take us through the pictures, here are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. First, can you help my Hampshire colleagues trace this man, Michael Albert Benson. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in December 1972, but since then has escaped twice and has been at large since May 1989. He even got married in the summer of 89 and lived in the Park Gate area of Southampton using the name Michael Johnston. He's 40 years old, 5 foot 11, slim build with a Yorkshire accent. He has three tattoos on each arm, one's of a woman's face with the word Mick under it. He's not seen his wife since May this year, although he may still be driving her car, a dark blue metallic Ford Orion like this. You may have seen him in it anywhere in the country since he gets jobs with security companies and is known to travel extensively. But if you have seen him recently, please be careful. I must warn you that he is potentially dangerous and you should ring us rather than approach him yourself. But please do call. If you recognise this decidedly shifty looking robber, you may lead officers to a team of thieves operating around Gerrard's Cross in Buckinghamshire. He didn't realise the camera was picking up every move as he stole an expensive bracelet. The next day, the same man was caught on video with a woman accomplice at a jeweller's in nearby Amersham. They distracted the staff and stole a valuable ring. The man is in his late teens, early twenties, six foot, slim, with short dark hair. We believe he's been involved in other thefts in the area. His accomplice is in her early twenties, five foot four to five foot six, and had blonde permed hair. Call us if you recognise them. British Transport Police investigating the theft of £28,000 would like to speak to Dave Jowery. Mr Jowery was working as a relief booking clerk at Morden Underground Station. On Wednesday the 10th of October he left work at 1pm carrying a large black bin liner and hasn't been seen since. Shortly afterwards it was discovered that the last few days ticket takings amounting to just under £28,000 were missing from the safe. Dave Jowry is 55, 5 foot 7, medium build and wears spectacles. If you know where he is, please ring us now. And finally, police in Merseyside would like your help to track down this cheerful amateur filmmaker. Perhaps the reason he's looking so pleased with himself is because he's just hired a video camera which he will fail to return. This is not the only time he's obtained expensive professional equipment in this way. Polaroid photos of the same person in the same suit have been taken in video hire shops in North Wales, Merseyside and Cheshire during September and October this year. These are taken as part of the hire agreement. Using stolen checkbooks and driving licences as proof of identity, he's borrowed and not returned £10,000 worth of video cameras and accessories. He's in his mid-twenties, five foot nine to six foot and of slim build. So if you recognise him or any of our other photo call faces, please ring us now. And here's the number, 0818118181. 0818118181. Over the last five years or so, the police and the legal system have evolved a much more sensitive and understanding attitude to women who have suffered rape. 
and as a result, more people have had the courage and the confidence to report what's happened to them. Nevertheless, according to the latest Home Office figures contained in the British Crime Survey report, still only one in five report sexual offences. Five weeks ago, a 17-year-old girl was raped after leaving a disco in West London. She courageously decided to work with the Crime Watch team in making the film we're about to see, in the fervent hope that the man who attacked her may be caught and that other women can be prevented from suffering what happened to her. Our reconstruction concentrates on the dialogue between the girl and her attacker, in which she revealed a number of clues to his character and his identity. Police artists have produced this careful likeness of him from her detailed description of his face. The girl herself has taken part in the film and interview, but her voice and her appearance have been disguised. The actress who plays her part doesn't look like her at all. But you may remember seeing the man outside the Broadway Boulevard disco in Ealing Broadway. It's the small hours of Saturday the 27th, Sunday the 28th of October. It's the night the clocks went back an hour. The new time is 3.30 a.m. I've seen Martin or Ian have you. Martin's supposed to be giving me a lift home. No, you just missed him. They've gone down there. If you hurry, you catch him. Oh, thanks. Why are you running? Are you OK? Do you know where South Ealing is? I haven't a clue. Look, John left home. No, thanks. I'm meeting some friends. That's no problem, look. It's full of strange men tonight. Look, I've met Do you mind if I walk with you? Look, where about you from? I told you, I'm meeting my friends. All ah, right. Looks like you missed them. Hey, look, I live in Southall, you know, but you know, I can give you a lift wherever you want to go. Look, I don't live near you, thanks. I live in Harrow, but I'm staying at a friend's house. He seemed really ordinary. I didn't feel threatened by him, probably because my mum and dad are Irish, and so is he. I didn't think that he was going to hurt me. So are you in the boulevard then tonight? Yeah. Hey, what's it like in there? You know, I've never been. It's OK. Look, here's my car here. You sure you don't want that lift? No, I'm... I'm going to St Albans. Look, I told you right. It doesn't matter where you're going. I could look and take you anywhere. Here. Do you want a cigarette? Thanks. John! John! When he pulled me into his car, he didn't scream at me and he wasn't vicious. So I didn't think that he was going to do anything. It worried me that I was in his car. But I just didn't dawn on me what was going to happen next. I thought I recognised one of my friends. He was standing by the burger van. So I called his name, but it wasn't him. He didn't even turn around and look at me. I thought if I kept talking to him, then maybe he wouldn't do anything. I couldn't run anywhere and I had nowhere to go, so I had to keep talking to him. You're not scared of me, are you? No, I just want to get out and meet my friends. Look, I'm not going to hurt you. Come on, I'm just holding your hand. Hey, you don't mind that now, do you? Look, if I tried to kiss you, you'd slap me, right? Yeah, I just want to get out. Right, right. You see, girls, normally when they hear my accent, they just walk away. They won't even talk to me. Because you're Irish? Yeah. My uncle's from Coleraine in Londonderry. All right. 
Where are you from? Me? Um, I'm from a wee village, actually, about 20 miles outside, called Rain. Are you Irish? I suppose you must be with those freckles, eh? Yeah, Tipperary. Ah, oh, lovely. Ireland's really lovely. I'd like to live there. You can say that again. I'll tell you, as soon as I finish my exams, I'm going straight back. Look, don't worry. Oh, come on. Hey, smile. That's it. I noticed that he had a lot of country and western Irish tapes in his car. There was a graphic equaliser on top of his radio and he had an empty packet of cigarettes next to it. When I started getting really worried about being in his car, I started taking notes of the road signs to see where we were. You like the old Irish country and western then? Not much. <laughs> I listen to it all the time. My mum does that. All right. Hey, you know, I go to quite a few places where they play it live. See? Don't mind me holding your hand now, do you? Please let me out. I don't go that way. I want to go to St Albans. Please let me out. Look, I told you, right? Hey, don't worry. then that he drove off down the slip road and attacked me. He told me that he'd done it before. He can still do it again, but he did it to me. So please, if anybody knows who he is, can they ring up Crime Watch and help? Well, Bill Douglas, he told the girl he'd done this before. Do you have any evidence that he has committed this kind of crime before? Well, we strongly suspect so. As a result of our inquiries, about a week after this offence occurred, we became aware of a young girl who lives in Greenford. She tells us the same story. She was collected by a man in a Redford Cortina who was an Irishman. He drove around Greenford, which isn't too far away from Ealing, where this girl was abducted. Subsequently, she unfortunately was raped as well. She describes the man as having a moustache, the same as this offender. So we believe they are linked, yes. So it's quite possible there could be other victims of this man too? Well, it's a strong possibility. I've got to consider that. The girl has been able to give you a detailed description, so if perhaps we can see the police artist's impression, you could run through his description for us. Yes, this man's described as a white male. He's about 22 to 25 years of age. He speaks with a Northern Ireland accent. We've got him as slim to medium build. He certainly uh, is of a confident nature. He has dark brown hair brushed back with a moustache. Well, he may or may not have a moustache, of course. We've got put alongside him there a picture of him as he might look without the moustache. He is a student, he said. During the journey, yes, he claims to be a student, and he also claims that he comes from the Coleraine area of Northern Ireland. The young girl who unfortunately was raped, she recognises the accent as being that of Londonderry in Northern Ireland. Mm. She did actually make the point to us that the actor's accent and his looks bear a striking resemblance to this man. Yes, she spent some time looking at this and she's confirmed those details, yes. Yeah. We, we don't, of course, know whether he was um, living in Southall, but uh, it's, or that he, whether he made these details up. That's right. That's a story that he's, he's put forward, but at present that's the best lead we've got to go on. He also had a very distinctive watch, the girl noticed. Yes, on his left wrist he had a gold wristwatch with a square face which was black. She's noticed that, she's noticed the inside of the car. And these are all things that we're looking for to try and detect this offence and find this individual. Right, if we can put all these clues together we can perhaps find two That's right. Um, the car was a red Cortina Mark IV. That's correct. Her parents have got, or did have, a red Cortina. It was a Mark IV, it was a GL, it was made between 1980 and 1982. It has a grey interior and the steering wheel has four spokes. If anybody remembers seeing the man at the disco at that, that time, he was wearing um, jeans and an Aaron sweater? That's right. He had, a, he had this white knitted uh, Aaron jumper on and the stonewashed jeans. Now, he would never have been allowed into the disco wearing those clothes, so he obviously wasn't there for that evening anyway. So if anyone saw him or the car outside it or in that area, also it had a distinctive radio cassette equipment in it, didn't it? Yes, we've looked at that. We've got a graphic equaliser incorporated with a radio, which is quite an expensive item. The graphic equaliser basically adjusts the tone of the music in the car. 
Right, it's quite an unusual feature. He was a smoker of Benson and Hedges cigarettes. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to this appeal? Well, this man clearly listens to uh, Irish country and Western music. We know that he's, he claims to be a student. He lives in the Southall area. He has this red Cortina. We would like someone to come forward and tell us if they know of an individual like that. Because, of course, we have to recognise it does take some courage for people to come forward Certainly, to the police. Very much so. The young girl who came forward was very brave. And anyone who comes and tells us these stories, we will listen to them and we will act accordingly. They can come forward in, with all confidence. There is no problem with us. Oh, Mr Douglas, thank you very much indeed. In fact, the Hertfordshire Force is known for the particular care and sensitivity with which they handle these cases, and some of the women officers who specialise in sexual assault cases there are actually here tonight in the studio to answer calls. So, if this man has attacked before, and if you've been a victim, ask to speak to one of these officers. The number here to the studio is 081 811 8181, or the direct line to the Watford Police Station is this, 0923 244444. That's 0923, which is the code for Watford, 244444. Well, now some brief appeals from police around the country. Here with Incident Desk are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. Colleagues in Gloucestershire would like to trace two men who threatened a security guard in Cheltenham and then had to kick their bike to get it going and make their getaway. On Friday the 26th of October at 4.30pm, Securicor were making a collection from the Safeway supermarket in Cheltenham. The security guard was walking back to his van when a man with a pump-action shotgun ordered him to lie on the ground. Another man appeared with an automatic pistol. They grabbed the money bags and fled down the road. Witnesses saw them get onto a Kawasaki motorbike, which they had real trouble starting. They made their getaway weaving through the rush hour traffic. The 40 bike was abandoned in Trinity School Lane, a quarter of a mile away. Who knows, it probably couldn't get much further. In fact, it was in need of major mechanical attention and colleagues are intrigued to know how it even got to Cheltenham, a distance of 100 miles from where it was stolen. Could it have been loaded into a van? Either way, did you see the Kawasaki bike being stolen from Alderney Street in Pimlico, London, on or after the 14th of October? Or perhaps you recognise the gunman? This video fit is of the man with the shotgun. He is described as five foot eight in his early to mid twenties, slim to medium build with dark, unkempt, wavy hair. The other man was also five foot eight and in his mid twenties, but he was wearing this cloth boiler suit, which was left in a skip close to where the bike was found. A logo has been removed from above the breast pocket and a section has been cut out of the collar. Do you recognize this at all? Although the guns weren't fired on this occasion, the two men are obviously dangerous and we urge anyone who may have any information to ring us now. There is a reward. Next, officers from Earlsfield and South London have set up an incident room to coordinate inquiries into a series of rapes and indecent assaults in Battersea over the past three years. In each case, the victim initially thought that the attacker was a mugger. He threatened them and stole their cash and jewellery. Then he sexually assaulted them. He was in his late twenties and five foot nine tall. On one occasion he made off on a racing bike. And here's another clue. During the last attack in September, the victim pulled a street button off his waistband. He was wearing dark trousers, a green parka coat similar to this, and a cream scarf around his head. We strongly believe that he may have committed similar offences that have not been reported. So if you recognise this man or can help in any way, then please call. Finally, have you seen handbags similar to this one appearing on market stalls in the run-up to Christmas? That's where my colleagues in the Met think that a lorry load of goods totalling £300,000 stolen in August will end up. These items are all top-of-the-range designer goods and should only be sold through selected retailers. These suits and dresses were recovered from an address in the East End, but the rest of the load, hundreds of garments, are still missing. All the leather goods have the Any logo on them and each of our items started off wrapped in its own white cotton bag. And here's a sneak preview of next spring's Fashion for Men. If you've been offered a Guy La Roche tie like this anywhere, ring us. I'm afraid it dropped off the back of a lorry. Do call us on this or any of our incident desk cases. And this is the number, 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. 
Well, several names have been put forward so far. I've just heard that two people have rung up independently, giving the same name for a man who fits the description of the person wanted for the rape that happened in West London and then in that car journey out to Hertfordshire. There are also uh, names being put forward for the raider who pointed the shotgun at the police officer, and uh, that was up in, on Merseyside. We've got uh, a number of sightings of David Jarry. In fact, the call's coming in at a very, very fast pace at the moment. The one question we're asked, perhaps more than any other, about Crime Watch is how often do these calls actually lead to crimes we cover being solved? The answer is about one case in every three ends in convictions, and in one case in every five, the crucial factor was evidence from Crime Watch viewers. Even so, it can be pretty frustrating reporting on events because when detectives are actually closing in, obviously they don't want us to broadcast what they're up to. For example, I can't tell you more about one of the cases that we're particularly concerned about tonight where information is coming in now. What's more, even when arrests happen, the cases can take years to go through court. But we've gone back to 1985 and 1986 to bring you up to date with programmes you may remember. And incidentally, though there's precious little to be light-hearted about, it's an interesting chronicle of Sue's changing hairstyles, too. Our next reconstruction is the tragic death of Diane Sindel in Merseyside. Diane was killed sometime around midnight on Friday, August the 1st, on Borough Road in Birkenhead. 21-year-old Diane worked as a florist in Seacombe. She was due to get married the following year and was working part-time at the Wellington pub in Bebbington to help her save. That evening, she left work as usual at 11.30pm for the five-mile journey home. But her van ran out of petrol along Borough Road and she started to walk home in the direction of Tranmere. Just after midnight, this bus driver, Gary Lamb, saw Diane walking along and looking in her bag. Then, a few minutes later, a taxi driver saw a couple who seemed to be arguing. The woman matched Diane's description. Diane's body was found next morning in an alley off Borough Road. The next day, a couple exercising their dogs on Bidston Hill noticed someone had started a fire. They found items of clothing still burning. Among them was a charred page from a Barclays paying-in book. The call was made immediately after the programme and received at the murder incident room at Birkenhead Police Station. It was from a woman who at the time of the murder was living in Birkenhead but had subsequently moved to Cumbria. She told us that the day after the murder she'd been walking with her boyfriend on Bidston Hill when she'd seen a man running from the area where Diane's clothing was found. On interview they were able to give us a very detailed description of this man. This was obviously a main line of inquiry and five days later led to the arrest of a man. Police had other forensic evidence and after the longest murder trial in Merseyside legal history, a local 29-year-old unemployed labourer was given life imprisonment. First on incident desk, a rape in Basildon in Essex. It happened at lunchtime on Wednesday, March the 19th, at a house on the A13 in Thundersley. A woman was attacked with a hammer and raped in her home. Our graphic artists made a video fit, and we also showed a profile of the assailant's clothing. It led a group worker to ring police and say he believed they belonged to a young man who'd gone missing from a youth treatment centre a few days before the rape. Roy Page ran a corner sweet shop in the old part of Bedminster and regularly stayed open from early morning to late in the evening. His body was found in the back of the shop on Thursday the 18th of July. Mr Page had run his shop for ten years and most of his customers were regulars. His wife had died three years earlier and since then his sister Shirley came round to help. This money here, I'm putting it back in the safe. At 4.30 that afternoon, a man was seen hanging about outside Roy's shop. He was carrying a small transistor radio. At around a quarter to five, he visited a neighbour. Hello? Hello, I'm looking for a gas leak. Have you got any gas? Oh, I haven't. I've got it on. Please. Do you mind if I... No. I've got some. I mean, because please. Okay. we've had reports in the area of a yes, gas leak, okay. you see. Okay. You ever okay. got a glass of water? Yes, of course. Off? But I think you'd better let me do it. Because All right. He was sweating and seemed nervous. 
About five o'clock, he was back outside Roy's shop. Three hours later, the police were called. Every gas appliance in the house had been turned on, and Roy Page was dead. Seven days after our crime water reconstruction, the bogus gas official was seen on the south coast. The scene was all too familiar. Once again, he called at a corner shop. A crime watch viewer saw him walking back towards the shop and was the first of six witnesses in two hours round Portsmouth to call the police. This man saw him settle down on the grass and recognised him straight away. He fitted the reenaction completely. He was a dead ringer for the guy, almost more or less identical to the actor. But I think I just spotted the guy that was on Crime Watch UK last week. He committed murder in Bristol, I think. The man was arrested, and a detective from Bristol went down to see him. He was just as I pictured in my mind's eye uh, during the investigation. I introduced myself and said that uh, I was from Bristol, and I arrested him for the murder of Roy Page. And again, I'll never forget this. He, he replied uh, that he wanted a drink of water. And I thought, this is the man. It must be the man because the witness, Mrs. Perkins, had described how the fellow wanted a drink of water. Have you ever got a glass of water? Yes, of course. But I think you'd better let me do it. Because... All right. It's it, it sorted in so neatly. It was just uh, almost too good to be true. The events in Portsmouth were a complete rerun of the events in Bristol. At 3am on Saturday the 19th of March, four men were driving home towards Great Harwood in Lancashire. They're about three miles from Blackburn Town Centre when they passed this lay-by. On the opposite side of the road they saw something burning. At first they thought it was a tailor's dummy, but as they got close they realised that it was a person. Lancashire police arranged for an expert to make a sculpture of the man's head in the hope that someone might be able to identify him. Indeed, a viewer did ring in and identify the face while the program was on the air. The victim was 38-year-old Sabir Kassam Kilu. In most murder cases, the killer is known or related to the victim, and this was no exception. Three members of Sabir's family are now serving life. His wife, one of her sisters, and one of her brothers. Our final case tonight is a daylight robbery in which the bandits were armed with pistols, a shotgun, and a lollipop. It was Tuesday the 18th of November in Hyde in Manchester. A man was seen to get out of a red van in Corporation Street about 200 yards from the bank. Then a few minutes later in Water Street the same van dropped off another two men. Minutes later a Securicor van was making a routine stop. The total delivery was for £200,000. My family and I were all going out for the evening. I was sat there watching the television, touching my makeup up, and Crime Watch came on the television. They showed the top of the lollipop, which I instantly recognised as mine. I don't know why, but it was six cents or something, but I knew it was my lollipop. Sure, I'm just in my lolly on the telly. It's called lollipops. Where did they get this from? Well, we don't know. We've not found the owner of it. Right. So if anybody knows where this comes from, I go, it's five years old or so, at least. That's correct. Well, it's said that... It's uh, an old type. That's correct, because the modern ones have a plastic pole. Is that a crime watch? Well, after she'd uh, contacted the police, uh, I sent a detective round to her address, and uh, he had the lollipop with him. She had a look at it and she identified it by two screw holes that were actually at the lollipop end of the stick. These had been fitted by her husband. About a year later, uh, uh, as a result of a lot of inquiries in the Greater Manchester area, a team of uh, four people were arrested for a number of conspiracy offences. 
the information relating to this lollipop links well into those and as a result at a future court date apart from a number of convictions one of those responsible uh, obtained 14 years in prison so thanks very much to viewers one in five of crime watch cases are cleared up so let's hope there'll be more successful results like that on tonight's cases but we'll end with one of our most popular features aladdin's cave our treasure trove of unclaimed property comes this month from storage at police headquarters in Peckham in South London. But it could, of course, come from burglaries anywhere in the country. Here's Eric Knowles. Thank you, Sue. Well, I have to admit that my biggest social impediment is tea. Not drinking it, I'm afraid I hate the stuff. But for some reason, I do like teapots and I do like tea caddies and I like this tea caddy. Dates from around about 1820 and it's decorated in a penwork technique with lots and lots of small different animals. Wonderful object. But equally wonderful is a rosewood Davenport. Now, don't be fooled by the drawers on this side. They're all dummies, I'm afraid. The real thing's at the other side. Now, we do have quite a few carriage clocks in the cave, but these two are little jewels. Take this one, for example. Both French, both late 19th century. This one's decorated with the most wonderful silver fili filigree panels. And its big brother, well, it's decorated with Chom Levy panels also. Now, Here's another different type of enamel, guilloche enamel, a brush set. It dates from this sort of Art Deco period, maybe around about 1925-30. But what makes it interesting is this RAF little applique in the centre. Very British. Equally British, a set of four sporting prints, fox hunting. Nice, hand-coloured, 19th century. Love the prints, hate the subject. However, come and have a look at this. This is quite an exciting object. This is a reverse painting on glass. What's more, it's Chinese. It's made for export in around about 1770, and it depicts the figure of Hebe, a very expensive Hebe, I would add. Next to it, a pair of them. Notice treacle paintings, don't ask me why. They're actually reverse, um, the, the prints reverse painted, and uh, in this case, they depict the four seasons. Underneath two of the seasons, autumn and winter. This time, Dresden. And um, they're actually copies of Meissen figurines that date from the 18th century. Next to it, figure of Byron, Lord Byron completing Greek outtire. Um, alas, Lord Byron dates from around about 1818. He's not an 1850s example. Now, here's a chap with, with, with whom I have something of an affinity. Having a five-day-old baby boy, I know what it's like at three o'clock in the morning. And here he is at the end of the bed, uh, a German fairing came with a whole group of fairings, mostly German and mostly turn of the century. Here's a delightful little bronze figure of a girl. She's not signed in any way. Perhaps the age of innocence would do. But in front of the dog, well, that's a different matter. That's PJ Men, a top French animalier, and um, he dates from around about 1850. Good quality and also top quality. Look at this mirror frame. Minton, 1830, those wonderful floral encrusted flowers. I could almost pick one off and put it in my buttonhole. Stands on a fabulous French table, marquetry inlay, 18th century, alas, style only, but obviously from a good home. From a more humble abode, what about this little rocky? Uh, it's a lambing chair, and I can just imagine the farmer's daughter in about 1800 nursing her favorite little lamb back to health. However, uh, should you prefer an old master, or dare I say, should you prefer an old malt, maybe this little secret cabinet's more to your keeping. But if you are a secret drinker, this Christmas, please don't be a driver as well, please. Well, thank you very much, Eric. The number to ring if you recognise anything there is 081 811 8181 or call New Scotland Yard direct on 071 230 2301. That's 071 230 2301. We're getting a lot of calls to the studio this, this, this evening. There's been a steady stream of calls on both our reconstructed cases tonight. Viewers have been suggesting names for the armed raiders in Liverpool who were chased by a motorbike policeman. And there's been a marvellous response on the Ealing rape case. We've had a lot of calls with a lot of valuable information, but we do need more information on that particular case. So do ring if you know anything on that case, and indeed any of our cases tonight. We'll be back at 11.45 with our update, but meantime the lines here are going to stay open. The local numbers for the police are on CFAX on page 618. And that's it for this month and indeed for this year. Don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>